Hi, my name is Dr. Brian Louie, and I am a thoracic surgeon and a member of the Division of Thoracic Surgery at the Swedish Cancer Institute and Medical Center in Seattle, Washington. Today I'm going to talk to you about esophageal cancer, including the different types of esophageal cancer, risk factors, symptoms, diagnosis and staging, and the treatment of esophageal cancer. I will also talk to you about what to expect when you come into our office to talk about possible services that Swedish can provide you or your loved one when going through treatment for esophageal cancer. At Swedish, we use a multidisciplinary team made up of radiologists, pathologists, oncologists, radiation oncologists, gastroenterologists, and thoracic surgeons to manage esophageal cancer. We are all here to work with you as a team to make sure you get the best care possible as you go through your cancer treatment. What is esophageal cancer? The, esophagi the esophagus is essentially a tube that connects your mouth to your stomach. It typically is around 35 to 40 centimeters in length. And when there's uncontrolled growth of cells commonly known as cancer, it can develop in any place along that length of that tube, from the back of the throat all the way down to the top of the stomach. There are two main types of esophageal cancer, squamous cell carcinoma and adenocarcinoma. The squamous cell type is a cancer that arises from the simple lining of the esophagus. And its major risk factors include chronic alcohol use and tobacco use. It tends to be found in the upper and the middle part of the esophagus, whereas adenocarcinoma is a cancer of the glands found in the esophagus. It's typically found in the middle to the lower aspect of the esophagus, and its main risk factor is chronic gastroesophageal reflux disease or acid reflux. It is also associated with the existence of Barrett's esophagus, and Barrett's esophagus is a condition that develops at the junction between the esophagus and the stomach due to chronic reflux, which can burn away the simple lining of the esophagus. This causes the body to change the lining in the esophagus so that the cells resemble the stomach. These changes are made by the body in hopes of protecting the esophagus from further acid exposure. The problem is that the Barrett's lining is unstable and continues to change over time. Chronic reflux that occurs daily for many, many years is the major risk factor for the development of Barrett's esophagus and therefore may be related to the development of esophageal cancer. Squamous cell carcinoma, which used to be the most common type of esophageal cancer, now represents less than half of all new cases in North America. Adenocarcinoma is now considered to be a huge problem in North America and other Western countries. Originally quite rare, the occurrence of adenocarcinoma since the 1970s has grown 600% over the last 30 years, and these numbers continue to rise today. There are many possible explanations for the dramatic increase in rates of adenocarcinoma, but it is believed that the growth is largely driven by the fact that over 50 million Americans have chronic gastroesophageal reflux disease. So what are the symptoms of esophageal cancer? Well, there are two groups of symptoms that patients come to see me with that may be signs of esophageal cancer. About half the time, the patients complain of a sensation that food sticks or hangs up when they swallow, uh, and this is called dysphagia. Other symptoms that tend to go hand in hand with dysphagia include weight loss and early feelings of fullness. The other half of the time, the patient will present complaining about long-standing heartburn, regurgitation, and or stomach problems. In the course of evaluating these problems, reflux or Barrett's esophagus is found, and often a cancer is found incidentally while investigating these issues. It is important to communicate with your doctor about your symptoms, either about the symptoms you are having, or if, you're sudden, if your symptoms suddenly go away. Many people will buy over-the-counter heartburn medication and stay on them for years without even talking to their doctor, even though the box usually recommends not using these medications for longer than eight weeks. Another interesting thing that patients of esophageal cancer tell me is that they've had heartburn for many, many years, then all of a sudden their heartburn got better, so they stopped taking their prescribed medications. Instead of this being a positive sign, that change in sensation is probably when the person developed Barrett's esophagus. Shortly after symptoms go away, patients tend to come to see us with an inability to swallow. So it is very important to report these changes in, to your physician early. Some people have developed Barrett's or even cancer after years of self-medicating themselves for heartburn without their doctor's assistance. Because of these reasons, it is extremely important for you to communicate with your physician 
about any symptoms that you are having, any medications you are taking, and any changes that you have experienced. You know best what feels healthy for your body, and we are here to help you read the signs and decide what steps need to be taken to prevent or treat disease. How is esophageal cancer diagnosed and staged? Staging, like every other cancer, the esophageal cancers are based on the tumor itself, how deep the tumor has grown into the esophagus, whether it is spread to the lymph nodes that are near the esophagus, and whether it is spread to other organs such as your liver, your lungs, or your bones. For the most part, stage 1 is early and stage 4 is late or metastatic. An easier way to think about it is that staging can be grouped into three categories, early, middle, and late. Early includes less invasive cancers that, do, that have not spread outside the original uh, organ. In the middle means that the cancer is locally advanced or is particularly bad around the esophagus. When it is late, cancer is metastatic, meaning that the cancer is spread outside the confines of the esophagus into some other organ structure or lymph node. The barium swallow or endoscopy are usually done when the patient presents to their primary care physician with symptoms such as dysphagia. The physician will usually start off with the barium swallow. The barium swallow is an x-ray test where the patient swallows a liquid barium solution. Because of the barium, the cancer may stand out on an x-ray. After this, the patient is usually referred to a member of our team for an upper endoscopy. During an upper endoscopy, we make you sleepy, and then we pass a fiber optic scope down in your esophagus that allows us to take biopsies or tissue samples to allow the pathologist to make the diagnosis. Ultimately, the pathway goes to endoscopy and biopsy so that we have some pathologic tissue to examine and use to make the diagnosis. 99% of the time, the diagnosis is made with a combination of upper endoscopy and or barium swallow. The next step is usually to get a CT scan or CAT scan to look for obvious cancer around your esophagus. If the CAT scan is okay, then we will usually proceed with an endoscopic ultrasound and a positron emission tomography scan, which is commonly called a PET scan. These two tests are complementary and almost always go hand in hand. The endoscopic ultrasound will tell us how deep the cancer has grown into the wall of the esophagus and it gives us some information about whether or not there are lymph nodes around the cancer that may or may not be involved. The endoscopic ultrasound is important because it gives us information to help us design a treatment plan that will be most beneficial to the individual specific cancer. The PET scan is used to determine if the cancer has spread to places that the CAT scan hasn't picked up. For example, PET scans can tell us whether or not the lymph nodes may be involved with cancer. You may be offered an endoscopic mucosal resection, or EMR. An EMR is essentially a large tissue sample, or biopsy, that looks to see if there is cancer in the esophagus, and if, the, and if there is cancerous tissue, how deep does it grow into the wall of the esophagus. This is important because the larger scans are not very accurate at determining if the cancer is limited to the lining of the esophagus, or if it has gone into the second layer of the esophagus. How deep the cancer goes into the lining will determine the size of the operation needed. In some early cases, it is even possible to treat the cancer by taking it all out with the EMR. We'll talk more about that later in the treatment segment of this podcast. Once in a while, your doctor may use a bronchoscopy, laparoscopy, or a thoracoscopy, which all use flexible end endoscopic tubes with a camera on the end of it to allow your doctor to look inside your body. Bronchoscopy may be used for cancers that are in the middle or upper portion of the esophagus to evaluate whether or not the esophageal cancer has grown into the wall of the esophagus as well as into the airway. Because the esophagus and the trachea or airway are next to one another, if the cancer grows on the side next to the airway, you may find the cancer on both sides. Laparoscopy and thoracoscopy are very similar. They both use a minimally invasive technique to look into the belly or into the chest to make sure the cancer has, hasn't spread widely so that we avoid doing treatment that's not beneficial to you. Lastly, your doctor will put you through tests to look at your physical health. These include breathing tests and heart function tests. This is to make sure that your heart and your lungs are strong enough to withstand an operation 
because some of the surgical treatments that may be recommended are pretty big operations. Generally, these physical tests are done at the same time as the other tests I've talked about. Here at Swedish, we design each treatment plan based on the individual and their specific cancer. Often it is a combination of the medical oncologist or chemotherapy doctor, the radiation oncologist, and the surgeon working together with you to make decisions about your treatment. I generally encourage most patients that have esophageal cancer to see each specialist before they begin treatment.